Hi everyone, I'm Julian. Welcome to the Sustainable Finance Research Seminar. Today, I'm very happy to have Jonathan Harris with us with his paper, Investing for Impact in General Equilibrium. A really interesting paper that I've been uh, fortunate to have some peak previews uh, a while ago, and, and I'm really happy for Jonathan to present it here for us. Um, well, and we have the usual ground rules, right? Uh, so for clarification questions, uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Uh, but Jonathan also wants to get through with his material. Uh, so larger questions we'll address at the end. We'll stop officially at quarter past five, but you are welcome to stick around for longer and, and chat more with, with Jonathan in a smaller group. All right. Okay, well, with that, I wish you, um, you know, lots of insights with Jonathan. Jonathan, the floor yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Julian. Um, a pleasure to be here. And so thank you all for joining. So I'm going to talk about my new paper, Investing for Impact in General Equilibrium. And so to start with, I think it'd be useful to explain my background and motivation. I'm not coming from a standard academic position, but you can think of, uh, to some extent, total portfolio project um, as my kind of postdoc. Um, so it's an independent grant funded research project working with and for a group of philanthropists to help them find ways to um, use their investment strategies to be as supportive of their philanthropy as possible. Um, and so we do research, both internal proprietary research, but also public papers like this. Um, and, but we also are making real investments um, during this project. Um, and I should also mention I'm a lecturer and research affiliate at EDEC Business School. Now, this background is important because really the kind of investors that I include in my model that I'm going to go into um, really have potentially can have genuine, uh, deep altruistic motivations for their investment strategies. So I'm going to today go through the model that I use in the paper and then discuss how that can be conceptually looked at in terms of what I call total portfolio returns. And then I'm going to look at impacts in this model and how it results from different investor actions. And then hopefully I'm going to be able to get to um, the ultimate goal of the paper, which is to, to shed some light on what the optimal strategy for an altruistic investor might be. So, paper relates to broad range of, of different literature. Um, and I'll just highlight within what I call the supply and demand literature, a uh, recent paper by Betamia, Calve, and Joe, which is really the foundation uh, for my model. Um, it's a re really critical paper uh, leading into what I do here. And then there's the altruistic preference literature, which I see as informing um, the preferences that we might consider investors having in regards to sustainability or impact or ESG and so on. Um, and leads me to include two different types of altruistic preferences, non-pecuniary preferences in my model. And then there's, it's been wonderful to see such a growth in papers relating to um, responsible investment in general in, in recent years, I would put them into two streams. One is a stream that focuses on investor impact in particular, and really focusing on what is the end outcome resulting from investors having responsible investment preferences. Um, now, and there are many wonderful papers in, the, in papers in this literature. I would characterize them though as often using custom or bespoke models. Uh, so I, I do see 
this paper making a contribution adding a, a very modern asset pricing model and the supply and demand model to that literature. And then I would separately look at the ESG literature, which certainly is using the most modern asset pricing techniques theoretically and empirically, but just taking ESG scores is, is given and not really looking at does ESG actually equal impact or not. And then there's additional streams of literature that the paper relates to. I'll just highlight for the moment though, model, the model uncertainty literature, um, especially prominently highlighted by Hansen and Sargent. And that's important because when we're talking about uh, non-financial preferences in general, but especially altruism, it's quite likely that we should investors are going to have even more model uncertainty and ex more feelings of ambiguity, um, just as we might have even more uncertainty about how we should model such preferences. And that has important implications that I'll hint at uh, in my talk today. Uh, by the way, uh, kind of a shameless plug, I too, um, not detract from the modeling in this paper, I've put all of the philosophical and, and terminological choices that I've made in this paper into a separate paper where I discuss them in detail. So that's called a, a framework for investing with altruism. So to my model, it's a single period general equilibrium model with a primary market, a secondary market, a social good, and heterogeneous firms and investors. And it's really crucial that the firms have endogenous size because that's going to be the main channel for investor impact in my model is changing firm size. Um, it's also possible for me to consider firms changing their behavior, but uh, the main channel I look at is changing firm size based on investors reallocating their capital. So here's a bird's eye view of the what's the flow in the model. Um, and so at time zero, the investors have a certain amount of wealth available for investment. Uh, and I'm assuming they've already made their consumption choices at the time. And so then they allocate positive amounts of investment to each firm in the primary market. The firms go away and use that investment to install productive capital. In the meantime, the investors can trade between themselves in the secondary market, their fractional ownership in each firm. And there's a riskless bond to facilitate uh, some investors investing more or less than their initial wealth. At time one, the firms produce cash flows and distribute those to the shareholders, the investors. And so the time one wealth of the investors is formed based on those cash flows, but also with an exogenous wealth shock, which represents wealth that they may have from other sources that aren't in the market. Also, the firms produce contributions to a social good, which together with a strategic shock determines the social state at the end of time one. And it's both that wealth and the social state that determine investors' utility. So on the investment side, I'm going to work with two groups of investors, uh, a target group and a control group. And the difference is simply going to be that in running the different studies that I, I do, I'm going to set up the control group with fixed preferences and then vary the um, preferences and in information available to the target group um, or the beliefs of the target group. The investors, though, do all have perfect information um, on each other and on the firms, um, up, up to that they can have different beliefs about how to interpret that information. But I, so there's really no frictions in the model as I've done it in this paper. It'd be interesting to add imperfect information in the future. And so the capital installation function that I use is the same as in 
Betamir, Kelvey, and Joe. And so it has diminishing returns to scale, which really is important to generate the results on the demand side, as I'll discuss. And so the capital amount determines linearly the cash flows of each firm. They depend on a, a Gaussian random variable ZF. And the wealth of the investor is the sum of their exposure to each cash flow plus the, um, the wealth shock, the exogenous wealth shock. The social good, well, so each firm produces a contribution to the social good in the same way as they produce a cash flow, but this time the, the random variable is ZG. And those social contributions from each firm sum up uh, together with a strategic shock to form the time one social good amount. And so the strategic shock could represent a like a policy shock or something, so something that the firms don't control. And then I was just talking about the social good, which um, you know, could be important from say a, a, a pure altruistic perspective, but an investor may also care about their contribution to that social good or have some feelings about that. And so I consider holdings, what I call holdings-based warm glow. So in general, I would say warm glow is if an investor cares about an altruistic variable but they're able to change that variable they care about without actually changing, say, the genuine underlying altruistic variable, the, the social good. So in this case, I form a their warm glow as their fractional shareholding in a firm, F, multiplied by the firm's contribution to the social good. So that's the investor's the warm glow associated with their holdings in that firm. And then their total warm glow is the sum of their warm glows due to each firm. And I don't consider the strategic shock relevant here because of course the investor um, has, doesn't have a stake say in policy. Um, certainly not a, a financial holdings based one. And so, <coughs> so I've, noted how the cash flows and the social contribution of each firm depends on its capital K. So the financial shocks ZF have a mean value AN. And so it's these ANs that I'm thinking of when I refer to profitability. Whereas the social shocks, um, think call them social productivities and label them GN. And what makes sense to think about the GN as in, in my model is as the expected marginal impact of the firm per unit capital. So in the neighborhood of the expected equilibrium size of the firm, what is its marginal impact gonna be? And I will note here that it's not clear that how that relates to contemporary ESG scores. Um, may, maybe ESG scores are a good proxy for this, maybe they're not. I've seen basically zero analysis of that and I would be really interested to see that. Um, for the moment, I just, this is what I need for my model, these marginal scores. So presuming that they exist and the investors have access to this information. They've somehow done their homework and come up with these scores. So the investor's problem is to maximize their expected utility. Um, nothing complicated there. And they do that based on changing their investment amounts in different firms. Now, that just goal, simple goal of maximizing expected utility is very abstract. How can we make it more tractable and interesting? Well, we can take a second order uh, approximation of the utility function and then express 
it, in terms of the moments of the underlying variables. And that's how we end up with a mean variance um, setting, for example. But if we do this with the, uh, with the additional altruistic variables, then we get, of course, some more terms. And this is how I would group those terms. And I'd look at it in terms of um, at equilibrium, you're going to want to take the derivative with respect to an investor's investment amount in a, in a firm and uh, set that to zero as a first order condition. So the top row here is simply the standard financial mean variance setting. But then the second row, we get into impact returns. So that is, if it is possible that the investors changing their investment amount changes the, uh, the expected uh, amount of the social good, then, and the investor values that as in their, their gamma X, the, the derivative of their utility with respect to the social good in proportion to their derivative of utility with respect to wealth is non-zero, then you get kind of a quasi return um, that is comparable to the financial returns. And then you also have an uncertainty adjustment. And I say uncertainty adjustment because if, um, as I was mentioning before, if you get into the philosophy here, it's not clear that an investor should be uh, discounting just for altruistic risk, but they may, it could be justified to have an adjustment for model uncertainty. Um, and then last but not least, if the you get potentially mission correlated premium. So that is if the investor's marginal utility of wealth depends on the altruistic variable. So there are uh, conditions that depend on the altruistic variable where they're more or less happy to have additional wealth, then the correlation between the altruistic outcomes and their wealth could be important. And that's potentially very useful to investors because it could be, it's very hard to change the altruistic variables, but they can certainly change their portfolio weights very easily and therefore change if there are investments that are correlated with the social good that they care about, then they can um, change how their whole portfolio is correlated with that social good potentially. So a little diagram to summarize what's going on there. You have financial returns that increase the expected value of wealth, impact returns that produce value by increasing the expected value of the social good and potentially mission correlated premium, which don't have to increase either expected value absolutely, but increase the expected value of the product of the social good and wealth. And so just to formally say my equilibrium occurs when the first order conditions for each firm are satisfied and the secondary market clears, and then the market for the risk-free asset clears. So these are all standard conditions. I have a clarifying question. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Just before you do the analysis, hello, I'm, I'm Torsten from University of Zurich. Hi, so Torsten. your investors, they anticipate what would be the impact if they invest. So they look at the marginal change in production which their investment will cause? Um, yes, so as in they, with these impact returns, they, they are saying okay, everybody else investment fixed, if I put in an additional dollar to this company, what's going to happen? Um, and, and, and so then the equilibrium results, but I am gonna get into actually um, like how does the equilibrium adapt? Like if you, if you try and put 
tons of money into um, uh, a firm, then you could end up being the only investor in that firm. Which do they have a, a look through the equilibrium, or it's only at the margin? Um, only, only at the margin. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So in <laughs> so the equilibrium solution um, is here, and there's a lot going on behind the scenes. So this is like almost a high level peek at what the solution looks like. Um, so, uh, but I'll say that it, it, you know I want to describe the interpretation here. So it has a very similar format to standard result for a mean variance model. You have like a, a drift term, which is my M tilde divided by eta. And then you have the inverse covariance matrix, the sigma T. And the M tilde, the drift term, can be thought of as basically each firm's total productivity according to the average investor. So that is their profitability A, but plus their firm's kind of enterprise impact per unit capital G, um, weighted by the degree of uh, say pure altruism and the degree of warm glow altruism of the average investor. And the tilde here is indicating that these are aggregated in a certain way across the different types of investors in the market. Um, which I'm not gonna talk about in detail here, but just think of them as kind of the, the market average view of the total productivity, the total value that a firm is producing. And then the covariance matrix is a little different from the standard mean variance setup because the uh, it composed of a demand matrix and a supply matrix. So the demand matrix is there to account for the fact that um, there are diminishing marginal returns to investment. That's the capital installation function. And so th there's just from that angle, there's a certain um, size that the firm should ask uh, to be before diminishing marginal returns kick in and make further investments negative expected value. Um, and then there's the risk side, which is a supply matrix, which is the more capital the investors put into a given firm, the, uh, the more that's going to give um, their risk averse utility and, and negative value. So you can think of conceptually for a single firm as equilibrium occurring at the intersection between two curves, the upward sloping blue supply curve and the downward sloping red demand curve. And so how can we think about impacts in this context? Well, suppose you're an investor and you're, you, you're not, you haven't had access to a, a particular firm, um, but you gain access and therefore you're um, adding to the pool of capital that can invest in that investment. And so you're actually decreasing the, because you're enabling other investors to diversify, you're decreasing the absolute risk aversion each investor must hold with respect to that firm. So you're actually uh, decreasing the slope of the supply curve. So you're moving from the sol solid blue to the dotted blue line. And so that's going to increase the equilibrium amount of capital that's invested in the firm but decrease the uh, associated market risk premium that the firm uh, needs to offer. On the other hand, you could, everybody could already be invested in the firm, but you could take the view that the firm is more, uh, say, has more social good and more, is more socially productive. And so that's the dashed red line here. And so that in, indeed, um, so that's increasing the, you're kind of flattening the demand curve and, and, and uh, 
it's going to result in you investing more than the average investor. But on average, you would expect the equilibrium amount at the intersection between the dashed red line and the solid blue um, to be higher than before. But the <laughs> associated risk premium can go up as, as well. And so it's the interaction of these effects and which ways they go that's going to dr drive my results in, in my model and determine um, what the what the returns to greener firms are and how they compare to their financial um, basic financial returns. And so immediately highlight that just in um, a kind of basic calibration of my model where all firms have the same parameters except for varying on one dimension, it's very easy to generate deviations from the cap M. Um, and, that, and that's coming from the kind of Bettermeyer, Metermeer, Calvay and Joe's supply and demand framing. So if firms vary just in their financial volatility, then you get the standard CAPM setup of the firms with higher beta have more uh, correlation with systematic risk and so a higher expected return. But there are several features in the model that generate risk that's not um, diversifiable with market exposure. And so those generate expected returns that are orthogonal to the CAPM in a way. And so those in, in my model come from uh, correlations with the strategic shock, if the investor has altruistic preferences in that way. Um, correlations with the wealth shock for all investors in general, because that's purely financial. But also warm glow is, is not diversifiable in the market. So that creates changes to expected return. Now, one, one thing I would highlight here is that it's not obvious. Um, there's been a lot of debate in the literature recently about um, the returns to green stocks and, and why they've been high. And is it just a uh, temporary period? Because green stocks should have lower expected returns on average. Um, and that may be the case, but I would say looking at things from the perspective of Bettermeer and Calvay's model, uh, the correlations with the wealth shock are going to be the dominant feature. Um, and so I'll show that in a moment. So we could be debating kind of small potatoes if we're talking about the small changes um, to expect returns based on warm glow. So I calibrate my model with 100 firms. Uh, Can I ask once more? Oh, please. <clears throat> go, go, please go back to the previous slide. Uh -huh. So the warm glow, for example, on the green curve, is it higher the further you go up or is it lower the further you go down? Um, it would be like, like uh, firms with more social, uh, positive social productivity would right. have lower expected returns. Okay, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a very good call, clarifying question. Yeah. Right. Um, so 100 industries, I, um, set the wealth, total wealth of the market being 300 trillion. And to generate um, a nice distribution of firms of different sizes and types, I generate uh, the parameter values randomly, um, though I do make sure that 10% of the firms are nonprofit. Um, some maybe have profitabilities close to one, so more like social enterprises and some with a very low profitability is more like charities. And I use a default test group size or target group size of 1% of wealth. So that's basically I'm going to be examining what the impact of changing the preferences of 1% of investors can be. Now, so the drivers of preferences in my model. Um, 
assuming the investors has access to the information on the social productivities and so on, are these gammas. So gamma WW is of course risk aversion and I set that equal to three. And I have one benchmark equilibrium E0 where all the non-financial gammas are set to zero. So the investors are just not altruistic. And then I have an altruistic equilibrium where I've used the following values. And so for gamma G and gamma GW, gamma warm glow, I use one. And I think of these as basically equivalent to how you might think of um, the cost effectiveness of uh, different types of donations. So I'd say somebody who has gamma G equals one would be willing to donate $1 to avert, say, one ton of CO2 emissions um, if, if the unit of the social good is CO2 emissions, for example. It could be anything. Um, but considering it as CO2 emissions, I would say you know, estimates of the social cost of carbon are well above that, yet um, spending doesn't necessarily match with the estimates of the social cost of carbon. So I think it could be fair to say that uh, $1 per ton is a fair but non but small but fair amount for the representation of the average investor. Also, the philanthropists I work with believe that their the charities they've been donating to recent in recent years related to climate change, uh, many of them have achieved a cost effectiveness of less than a dollar a ton. So the philanthropists who I work with would actually not necessarily have a gamma G greater than one, no matter how altruistic they are, because they could see the marginal charity they can support as um, getting better results than that. Um, and that's why I call it a degree of altruistic urgency, because if you really felt you had no other way than to have impact via your investments, you might have a really high gamma G. But if you think there are things that you can use your, your money for in the future that will also produce similarly valuable results, then you will have a lower gamma G. So you could, gamma G doesn't me necessarily measure your altruism, it measures your urgency. Um, altruistic uncertainty aversion I set equal to one, which basically means it doesn't have a, an impact on the results. Um, though when I increase it to 10 later, it will. And gamma WG, the mission correlated strategic sensitivity, I set to 0 0.2, which to me, and I set the variance of the strategic shock to be equal to one. So to me, this means that a one standard deviation move in the strategic shock, say in climate policy, can move the investor's marginal utility of wealth by 20%, which seems reasonable to me that policy changes could have kind of that order of magnitude of an impact on how effectively an investor is able to spend their money. Um, Disclaimer, I'm solving an approximate version of my model. So in a mathematically purest sense, it's not the solution, um, but I think it's economically valid and interesting. But also when in some of the more extreme calibrations I look at, the, uh, the primary market positivity constraint is binding and to solve that in general is a very hard problem. Um, so I can't claim to have the perfect solution to that. But uh, I, I do think my results are valid and interesting. I just want to offer that grain of salt. So to start off with, just looking at the financials <coughs> in one of my calibrated equilibriums, um, the altruistic one, the expected return versus beta. There's just massive variation away from the CAPM. And I, I would say this is what you might, kind of result you might see if you were simply doing a, a, a CAPM exercise, say in class or something. Um, so I would say the model is already generating realistic financial features. 
Um, and the question is, compared to like how much of this dispersion in returns is realistically being generated by impact considerations. So to look at that, I consider this idea of total portfolio returns and the components I discussed earlier of the emission correlated premia impact returns and impact risk premia. Um, so, First of all, this is looking at all the firms. So there are a few um, of the, basically the charities that have, to make it into the model, they need to have very high impact. Um, to make in the model and get finance, they need to have very high impact. So they have very high impact returns. Therefore, it's natural that the required return an investor needs to finance those charities is is low as basically as long as they get some kind of tax break then they should be willing to donate to those charities now zooming in on the uh, higher profitability firms we can see that the dominant um, component of returns is market risk premium as we would expect that that's the the, the, the bedrock of finance and then the second one is financial alpha, which I'm defining as the risk premium for exposure to the wealth shock. Um, and, and that is how Bedermier and Calvé uh, look at alpha in their paper. But occasionally for some of the firms, the impact return may be significant or the mission correlated premium, um, but only for some of the firms. So I would highlight that um, there have been, been many recent hypotheses, and, and I, I think all very valid in the literature about like why um, why are green greener firms not having uh, negative expected returns. But I would say one possibility is simply just in terms of the natural. Uh, impact size of, of a given firm that uh, the impact returns are gonna be small. And another way of looking at this is if we group the <coughs> all the financial terms together, the financial return and the risk adjustment and the non-financial returns together as mission aligned returns, then that financial return plus mission related aligned return is the total portfolio return, which in equilibrium, it's the first order condition. So it should equal zero. Um, now to make things a little interesting, suppose an investor is looking at my non-altruistic equilibrium, but with their altruistic preferences suddenly turned on and say they have no exposure to the wealth shock. Say they're, they're a, a hedge fund or something and, and they are able or a, a private family office and they have limited exposure to the wealth shock so they can take advantage of the premia that offers. Then they would see something like this where they would see firms on either side of this total portfolio return frontier. And I've calibrated the size of the dots to the um, weight that the investor would put into these different firms once, once the equilibrium has adapted to their new preferences. So you can see mostly that they're, they're gonna end up investing in most of their wealth in firms with small mission aligned returns, but there are some firms that have both positive mission aligned returns and positive financial returns, but also firms that are negative in one way or another, but in a way that has a total portfolio return that's still positive. And how about, so this table shows summary statistics for each component of the returns. And so what I would highlight is that the impact and mission correlated returns have are more heavy tailed um, than, than the other returns. And partly that's a mechanical feature of I, chose a heavy tailed or in determining the G's of the firms, I set them 
to have a log normal distribution in their magnitude. So that's already heavy tailed. But there's an additional thing going on here, which is that the firms in equilibrium have different sizes. And so they're being pushed to different limits in terms of their diminishing returns to scale. And so that adds an extra amount of variability, which leads to these impact returns um, having an even heavier tail than the underlying distribution of the Gs. And I'll talk about that more in the next section on impact. So <laughs> decision relevant impact is counterfactual expected impact. And I mentioned that to say that I think we can really only study impact in models like this. And in practice, the philanthropists I work with are careful to always refer to what they're doing as impact assessment, not measurement, because you can never measure the counterfactual it by definition does not exist, but we can certainly and should attempt to assess how it ex um, what it might have been. So any impact requires an object, an action, and an actor. So I'm going to focus on investor impact, where the actors my target group of investors. And the object is how are they going to change the social good? And there are different actions I could study for them. Could I study them engaging with the firms uh, and, and management to, to change firm behavior? Um, I discussed that in my paper, but I don't really have that interesting results on it because I don't have a great model for the cost effectiveness of engagement and, and how that might work. So I focus on investment impact because that's all naturally part of this model. And so on investment impact, I look at two different types. So access, which is basically the inverse of an divestment. So what is the impact of an investor group gaining access to be able to invest in a firm? and uh, learning impact, which is the investor group may already be invested in a firm, but they are investing based on an assumption that GN equals zero. And then they learn the true impact of the firm, the true marginal impact. Um, what happens then? And to as part of trying to understand what's going on with the investment impact, I break it into different parts. So I refer to the simple parts as basically G times the change in capital of the firm in question, the target firm. Um, and I split those parts into part for the target group and a part for the control group, as in based on the change in fractional ownership in the firm, you can assign um, a, a, a change in capital to the to the target group, and then there will be a corresponding and possibly offsetting change in the capital owned by the control group. And then you can have the same in what I call the portfolio, which is all the other firms that are not the target firm. So all of these things are going to change in equilibrium when the investors make one move. So they're all important to consider. So investment impact of access looks like this. It's quite small um, and it's really dominated by portfolio effects. It's basically the bigger a firm you are gain access to or divest from, the, the more impact. Um, <laughs> the investment impact of learning is a bit different because in this case, the investors um, um, when they are in this altruistic setting, the other investors, uh, when the target group is unaware of G, they are more likely to invest in brown companies than the other investors. So when they learn just how dirty a company is, then they dramatically decrease their investment amount, maybe not divesting, but still. And so that leads to these very large positive impacts here. 
with these firms sorted by GN. It's different if we talk about learning from based on the non-altruistic equilibrium where the, invest, the target group is then the first investors to learn about G, in which case, basically the low hanging fruit is the not-for-profit firms. So that's where the, the main impact comes from there. And kind of there's offsetting portfolio effects with all the uh, less substantially impactful firms. And so looking at the statistics, the investor impact of especially of learning is very highly heavy tailed and skewed. And so why might we expect that to be the case? Well, we can analytically work out an analytical version of my model. And then we get um, that the investor impact of learning will have depend on multiple components, not just the enterprise impact. So the enterprise impact kind of determines the scale of the investor impact, but there are these other components, the scalability parameter, but also this, um, what I call neglectedness, which is the, the, the value of the enterprise impact that you're learning about divided by the market's current assessment of that firm's total productivity, which is gonna be uh, lower if the market already loves the company, maybe because it's highly profitable, but it's going to be higher if the market thinks the company is not profitable and not that impactful. Um, so I'm going to keep rushing into optimal strategies and then I'm at the end. Um, so <clears throat> how, what does this look like overall big picture for an investor with different with different preferences. Well, to study that, I vary one dimension of the investor preferences and see how um, that changes their behavior. And so I do this in with the default um, setting of the altruistic equilibrium. So the, but the, the control group has some level of altruism. And so the main thing I would point out here is by, as I increase gamma G for the target group, they are able to substantially increase their utility compared to what it would be if they stayed with their default policy. Um, but they do that by investing in increasingly, increasing amounts in concessionary investments and philanthropy. And so their portfolio expected return drops. A, some, an altruist with a lower gamma G, so lower than one, say, there's not really that much for them to do other than to, um, to hold the market portfolio and wait to keep deploying their capital for impactful things in the future. Um, that said, an altruist with lower urgency may also be uh, compatible with having lower risk aversion. And if that's so, then there is something for them to do. They can increase their utility by um, not so much increasing their leverage. I don't find they don't increase their leverage so much, but they certainly allocate increasing amounts of capital to the most risky firms. And those risky firms aren't necessarily the most socially productive firms. So they don't necessarily end up holding a super green portfolio, though um, to the extent the altruistic investor can both get high returns and high greenness, they, they will do that. Um, but they, they're not bound to it. Their priority is just having the optimal portfolio. And then lastly, pure altruism versus holding base warm glow for most of this talk, I've kept them fixed and equal to each other. So both um, both forces are coming into play. But if I separate them and increase, so the green curve here is when I increase the gamma G, the pure altruism, and the black is when I increase the urgency of warm glow. Really see that it's really with the pure altruism that you can 
uh, choose to put lots of money into say the charities and the nonprofit firms, which is, is the low hanging fruit for impact in my model. Um, it's not to say that the warm glow, holding space warm glow has no impact. It's just, it can't, um, it's relying, the warm glow is relying on influencing the other investors in the primary market to respond to its preferences because the warm glow is focused on the secondary market. Um, and so it can't really uh, proactively mandate that more capital is say put into uh, a non-profit firm. So to, to recap, um, impact returns and investor impact are heavy tailed. That's one of my key points. And that's natural because it, you can analytically see that it investor impact should depend on the scalability and neglectedness of a firm, not just its enterprise impact. And the value that an investor is going to put on their impact is going to depend on their altruistic urgency. So that's a key parameter to consider and that needs further research. Um, mission correlated premia are different from impact returns and can be useful to an investor, um, even if they find it really hard or unlikely that they're going to actually have investor impact. Um, so urgent investors should go after investor impact uh, and they're more likely to find that in the primary markets, if not in philanthropy. Whereas patient investors are more likely to find attractive opportunities in mission correlated uh, returns, for example. Um, finally, if I may, I just want to encourage uh, all other researchers in the community to please be very careful with your use of impact related terminology. I talk to practitioners who are consistently surprised at how brilliant academics um, can be sloppy in their use of terms like ESG and impact. Um, so I'd encourage you to, um, to be on the watch for that and, and to do your best. And I'm happy to talk offline about that and to review anything that you've seen or are writing. So thank you. Um, I hope we still have some time for questions. Thank you, Jonathan. And we definitely do have some time for questions. Um, please, at this point, just uh, unmute yourself and, and step forward. So if nobody asks question, I have two more. <laughs> Go ahead, Carson. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Jonathan might not know, but I did my PhD on general equilibrium. So I'm happy to see that at the end of my career, general equilibrium becomes important again. <laughs> the, so one question is, when you do general equilibrium and you have heterogeneous utility functions, it would be nice to have an overall welfare function to balance the different utility functions. And so you say, if they do this, this improves their own utility, but what happens to the other's utility? So do you have a overarching welfare function by which you could say this type of access or learning or whatever is improving the welfare of the utility yeah. averaged or so the social welfare function? Um. Yeah, so yeah, I, I kind of um, avoid solving the model in, in those terms, um, but I, I think it's definitely important to consider it in, in those terms. Um, so I would say, yeah, so I would say I haven't really looked at it from that ang angle, but it would be interesting to consider Right. So that's one reason why you do a general equilibrium model, because ultimately you want to argue that it's doing better for the society as such, and not only partially for this type of investor and that type of investor, but you would construct a social welfare function, which the, typically is a weighted average of the heterogeneous 
agents welfare functions where the weights might be the marginal utilities and this type of things right so that's what, what i learned when i was young <laughs> yeah yeah uh, yeah i mean so there's also um like when I was mentioning that the like disclaimer about the results, right. the um, like the general solution of a general equilibrium model with in investors who have competing views on the, what the externality is, especially I, I think is is a very complicated problem that in, involves issues in game theory that, to be honest, I. I I need to improve my understanding of so. Um, right. So it wouldn't be an authority to talk about it in general. I, I um, but but I yeah, I I would say, I guess a tension with with um, having a a single overall welfare function. With where I'm going with my model is that, the, the. Um, Inv investor groups could have like very different opinions of what is social welfare and what is valuable to them. Um, so that's why I focused on the single social good, maybe as like a single instance of so social welfare. Um, as in the altruistic either group may actually not care about the financial health <laughs> of the other group. Right. But every, everybody hopefully cares about the social good. Um, but it's a, sim a simpler approach would be Pareto efficiency. So there is an externality, this social good, right? And the question is whether impact investing removes the externalities. Can you restore Pareto efficiency with this? Um, yeah. Though I, I, so I haven't, I spent some time at the beginning of writing the paper thinking about that i haven't recently and maybe i should oh, might revisit that but I, th I think what i remember thinking at the time is that there's this the it's, it's like unclear i guess the the motivation for this paper is from uh is for the, the marginal investor so for each investor to um, to be maximizing for their own benefit, and which may be an altruistic benefit, but so it, it there, to me, there's a tension between that and then summarizing it in like a global Pareto variable, because like <clears throat> say the American camp may just not want like the, philosophically want to be included with the Chinese variable or the Chinese welfare and. Um, I understand. Yeah. I, just, I just wanted to see whether you thought about that. Because... Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think I think I should think about these things more. Um, but I, I kind of took them to the limit that I could think about them with this paper. And um, right. yeah. And this most philosophical question. So a pure altruist, as you show on your slide here, increases his own utility, right? Um, well, as, as it depends how you, you mean. So it, I mean, the green curve is upward sloping. E, so that's the utility of the altruist, right? Yes, and it, it's upward sloping because they their utility depends on uh, G1, so the social. Yes, no. I don't want to contest the result, but the word pure altruist. So altruist typically does something even though it might not increase his own utility. So um, pure altruist does something good, but independently of his own utility, <laughs> by the definition of altruism. Yeah, yeah. But, but then it needs to be fed back into their utility for us to handle it mathematically. No, so, I understand, but yeah. maybe this guy is not a pure altruist, but he's finally doing something good for himself, right? Because it increases his utility. Yeah, I, I think the the terminology I'm using there, um, I hope it matches up with um, Andreoni. 
1990. Um, mm -hmm. the, Julian maybe knows more about that than me. So um, ha happy, happy to adapt if I'm using in imprecise language or inconsistent. No, 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 just yeah. No, I, mean, I, I totally agree. As altruist as is somebody who tries to improve the world or his society without looking at his own utility. And in your case, he also improves his own utility. So it's yeah. just a terminology question. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, no, and I, I like it as a question be also because um, there's actually nothing in my model that requires altruism. I, I'm using altruism because that's. Um, a uh, a word that I like, but but actually yes, these um, these investors could be optimizing uh, for non altruistic reasons. Like they could care about the social good because not because they realize that the social good improves the welfare of others, but because they it's like. And there's right. private benefits they're get, they're getting from it, but exactly. But, uh, so that's that's what turns out in your model, and this is not what I would consider to be an altruist. <laughs> but yeah. it's just the terminology. Yeah, well, I, I would say it's it depends on things that yeah get abstracted away when you do the math. Like as, right. as in, it it would require a human monitor, a human judge, to determine whether their intention as impact investors call it was genuinely altruistic or not but mathematically the, the, the math doesn't care about right. their intention no i agree yeah. so thank you very much i think it's a great paper and so i don't want to monopolize the discussion <laughs> that maybe i should try. Oh, i mean if, <laughs> and please keep asking if nobody else has questions no, no, no. i should <laughs> shut up maybe the others will also ask questions uh, no, person, I uh, much appreciated. These are interesting questions. No worries on that front. I will now at this point, um, you know, because we are at quarter past, uh, officially thank you, Jonathan, for, for being here today. And uh, yeah, thank, thanks so much for presenting. And I'll, after your goodbye, perhaps I'll, I'll stop the video and then we'll have more time to talk. But uh, for, on, on behalf of all of us, thank you, Jonathan, for being with us today. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Thorsten. Thank you, everybody.